with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce our speaker today for this session. Um, Rowena Merritt is joining us um, as a research fellow um, in the Centre for Health Services Studies at the University of Kent, and she's also a, an affiliate professor at the University of South Florida, which is a nice place to, to be um, associated with. Uh, Rowena has expertise in social marketing, particularly to improve outcomes and behaviour change, and she's worked as part of um, the public health team at the Department of Health, implementing their Ambitions for Health social marketing strategy. More recently, she's worked with the World Health Organization and the World Food Program, and she joined the Center for Health Services Studies at the University of Kent in 2013. So we're really privileged to have Rowena here today, and she's also involved in the ARC, and we're very pleased about that, advising us on implementation and impact measurement so that we can really show what impact and benefits the ARC is, is bringing to the region over this first five years. Um, so Rowena is going to share her tips and her experience in impact and, and today and I just wanted to say very much thank, uh, thanks for um, hosting this session and just hand it over to you Rowena to get started. So today as Mel was saying we're going to be looking at this concept of pathways to impact and it's really popular at the moment a lot of the funding grants talk about it but it's also really important because at the moment, often with research, we focus on what I class as an academic output. So people say, oh yeah, we've had great impact because we've published in the BMJ or we've published here or I presented at this conference. And though that's important and it's positive and it's a good thing to do, it doesn't necessarily lead to applied impact on the ground where it's actually needed. So during today's session, we're going to think about how we can move beyond those traditional academic outputs, move beyond them to think about how can we gain impact from our research and explore really like what's feasible, what's realistic to do, um, how can we do it best, those types of things. Like I'm not an expert on this area I just work in this area and I've worked in it for a long time, but I wouldn't class myself as an expert, but I'm going to take you through what I do and what works for me and what has worked for me in the past. And hopefully it will help with your research and thinking about how you can develop your own pathway to impact statements and then actually implement it. So we're going to start by looking at the definition, like how do we define impact within this research agenda? Then we'll look at some of the things around getting started. So how can we do it and how can we do it well? Who should we engage? That type of thing. Then we'll explore the difference between outputs, outcomes and impact. Then we'll just think about the practical considerations like what needs to be done to get the impact what needs to be done to see change at a grassroots level or a policy level and then hopefully there'll be lots of time for questions comments and q a so if we start with the definition so it is a very broad definition that's normally used when we're looking at impact so this is a definition that you often see. It's a contribution that research makes to society and the economy. And for me, it's really good that it's broad because I think when you think about impact, you have to think about it at different levels. So you have that policy level, that kind of top level impact work that we often do. But just as importantly, you've got the kind of grassroots, lower level community work that we do where you can see your impact. Or it might be facility level, for example, in a hospital, et cetera. So by having this broad definition, it allows you to explore impact at kind of the top end, the like policy level, all the way down to that grassroots level. So in relation to getting started, I think the first thing I would say is find your passion. And I know that sounds a bit naff and a bit twee in many ways, but I have honestly over the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years worked on lots of different research projects. And the projects that I'm not that 
interested in, the projects that I'm doing because my boss has told me to do them, I get very little impact if I'm being completely honest. I mainly get impact where it's a topic area that I'm really passionate about, where I am, I, where I want to see tr change and I drive that process forward. So I think it's really important that first of all, you think about, you know, what are you passionate in? What change do you really want to see? Once you've thought about what you're passionate in, what you're interested in, as I said, that is really key to drive in this impact because it's not easy to get impact at any level. So without that passion, it doesn't always happen. So after you've thought about that, the next thing that I always do is I do a stakeholder mapping exercise. And I do that with my research team. So it's normally me and a couple of other researchers. We sit down and we think about the problem that our research will contribute to. Now, sometimes that problem is really broad. So I've got a project at the moment that's looking at malnutrition in Tajikistan. So that's an incredibly broad topic area. But I also have a project that's looking at mask wearing in refugee camps in Syria. So that's quite a very narrow, narrow um, topic area and a narrow audience. So think about the problem that you're trying to address that your research will help contribute to. And then think about, well, who are the key stakeholders? So to do this piece of research, who is it important to engage with? Once we get the findings of this research, who has the power to actually implement these findings and who has the interest? And it's really important that you try and identify the people in the blue box. So the key players, the people who have both power and interest. Now, depending on your project, they could come from all sorts of organizations. So my project in Tajikistan, of course, I've got the obvious, like the Ministry of Health, I've got the UN organizations, um, but I've also got kind of the smaller NGOs in that group working at that, that kind of more grassroots level. So I identify the key stakeholders, and then I spend time to try and engage with them. And I normally try to do this via a stakeholder workshop. Um, and this is a picture of one of the stakeholder workshops we ran in Bangladesh at the start of a research project, where we could get all interested stakeholders working at all levels of society together to discuss these key questions in relation to the research. First, what social health impacts do they think could arise from the findings? What groups or organizations or individuals may be able to apply the research findings? And for me, most importantly, what does success look like? Because it's really important that we're all on the same page. Now, the reason why I started to do this stakeholder engagement at the very start of a research project um, was because when I worked at Department of Health and when I worked at the World Health Organization, we would have lots of researchers, often the top academic researchers in the field, coming in and presenting their findings to us. And we would smile and we would nod and we would ooh and ah and say, oh, that's really interesting. And then we do sod all with those findings, if I'm being honest. And the reason why is because we weren't engaged at the start. We weren't involved in discussing the research questions that we wanted to explore or the methodology that was being used. So even though this sounds really time consuming, and I wouldn't do this process if the funding was 3,000 or 5,000 pounds, I'd only do it for bigger um, bids. But even though it sounds time consuming, without that, you often get to the end of the project and have awesome research and awesome results. And yet it's very difficult to get anybody to actually implement them in practice. But if these people have been engaged with from the start, then they have a sense of ownership. So I think that's why it's really important to kind of have these types of discussions with key stakeholders. 
there's lots of different areas where you can think about impact. Um, and these are just the ones from the KSS arc that we'll be assessing the arc's impact by um, some of the ones. And some are easier than others. Um, you know, engagement with people, much easier than actual impact um, or improved health and well-being, et cetera. So there's lots of different measures that you can think about, which I'm going to talk about now in a bit more detail. So the next thing to consider is the difference between outputs, outcomes and impact. So these are three levels that I always think about when I develop my pathway to impact and when I try to ultimately get impact. And some are easier to get than others, you might say, but they're all interlinked. So if we start by looking at outputs, what do we mean by outputs? Well, as I mentioned before, you have your traditional academic outputs, such as conferences, um, academic journals, blogs, that type of thing that we do. But there's lots of other ways where you can expand the reach, basically, of your project and the reach of your research findings. So you might look to develop a concrete product to try and get sustainability. And at the moment, um, toolboxes seem quite popular, you know, those kind of how to guides. Um, I did a piece of work a few months ago for a local authority in London, and we used a new methodology called Nimble Trials. And we used this methodology in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic response work. So they wanted a toolbox at the end of it so that we could try and get a sustainability around people using this new methodology. So some things like that are nice, clear outputs. I would say if you are going to develop any such outputs, such as toolboxes or how-to guides, it's absolutely vital that you create them with the people you need to use. So, for example, with the local authority, I sat down and we developed it together. So it wasn't me going away and developing a toolbox and then giving it to them. It was very much a joint 50-50 activity. Otherwise, they just wouldn't use it. It would sit on a shelf or sit in a virtual um, database and never be used. And that's what I didn't want. And it was the same with how-to guides that I've developed for local authorities. If we've used a new methodology, then I've run training on that methodology so they can actually use it as opposed to just creating a product that never gets used. I try to always gain reach also through meetings and going to the right meetings at the right time. And this is why engaging with stakeholders, the people who have power and interest in your project from the start is absolutely vital. Because I have no issues getting on the agenda of the meetings that I need to attend because it's often attached to the stakeholders. So in a way you gain your stakeholders network and it's either your stakeholders actually presenting the findings because they they've taken ownership for it, or they can bring you along to their meetings to present the findings. With some projects, I try to get mass media. So if, for example, I want to get a conversation going, then that's when I'll go for mass media reach. Um, and also, we often try to get presentations to policymakers or relevant professionals. Although I would stress this is not impact. As I said, with WHO, I had lots of people presenting their research findings to me. And whilst academics might class that as impact, in reality, it didn't necessarily impact on the ground. So I'm gonna give you two examples of um, recent projects I've worked on where I've developed outputs from those projects. The first is around young people's attitudes to social distancing and self-isolation during the COVID pandemic. And this was a qualitative study of about 26 participants. We used a new methodology, so that's why we developed a toolkit. But then more importantly, we used the findings to develop a series of social media adverts. Um, 
to try and reach people with messages that would actually resonate with them. So we took the findings, we pulled out the key insights, and then we worked with the communication teams across local governments to actually develop more effective messaging for young people in London. So it was a very nice way of where we could show um, we had greater reach and greater use of the research findings. The second example I wanted to share with you is a little bit of a different one. So this was a 5K um, study. So yeah, we only got about 5K for this study. And it was to look at an unusual topic, which was around men breastfeeding in Uganda. So in Uganda, there is a new um, trends you might say where men will breastfeed from their partners from their wives so this often happens whilst the baby gets formula milk so the men get the breast milk instead of the baby or um the men would feed first and then the baby um, would feed second um, so it was a very interesting study, quite a controversial and complex study. Um, but because we only had 5K to actually do the whole project, we had no money to think about impact, really. And we, had, we didn't even have money to publish in an academic journal. We had, you know, we had no money for this whatsoever, really. Because by the time we bought flights out to Uganda, paid for the research team in Uganda, all the money was gone. So with this project, I was trying to work out how could I have any type of impact? Um, how could I get maximum reach? And my aim with this project was just to get a conversation going because it was a very small scope and study. So we had to think, how can we get a conversation about this going? So more people um, research this and more is done to um, stop this problem that's developing. So what I did is I contacted the Guardian newspaper and I asked to see if there was a, a journalist who might be interested in writing this story up for us. And luckily, the Guardian newspaper was very interested. And so they published um, the article. And before I knew it, it was viral. Um, I got to go on Radio 4 with Jenny, which was very exciting for Women's Hour. But more importantly, it was published in over 30 different newspapers in lots of different languages across the globe, not just in Africa, but also, you know, in America, New Zealand, Europe, etc. So really importantly, it got the message out there. It got people talking about it and it got researchers interested in this topic area. And um, it even was trending on Mumsnet as a conversation. So I thought, actually, this is good impact if it's trending on Mumsnet and people are talking about it. If I'd had more money, I would have done lots of other things, but because I just had 5K and we'd spent it all, I had to think about what, how I could do something cheaply or for free, basically. And this is what was done. So there's two examples where we've got output and we've tried to get reach and we've developed products, et cetera. Now moving into the more complicated areas, if I'm being honest, and this is about outcomes. So in relation to outcomes, I try to answer two questions. What changes do we want to see? And who do we need to make those changes? Now, again, this is where your stakeholder engagement comes in absolutely invaluable. Because if you've engaged with these people at the, part, at the start, if they feel like equal partners in the process, then often these questions are very easy to answer. However, if you've gone away and you've done the research by yourself and you're looking at the research findings and wanting people to implement them, that's when it's, it's more difficult. With these questions, we often try to answer them during the very initial stakeholder engagement workshop. However, we come back to these questions after we have the research findings. Because I'll be honest, some research projects I've worked on, you just get pretty much bog standard 
results or results that are not what you expect or even negative results, like something's not worked, we often get that as well. So with these projects, you know, actually, if it hasn't worked, I don't really want anybody to make any changes, to be honest. Um, but sometimes we get also really unusual findings. So for example, with the Ugandan breastfeeding study, I thought the problem would be around health and that the men were breastfeeding from their partners because they wanted the health benefits of breast milk. But it turned out it was a gender issue. It was about control, uh, coercion. So actually, the findings were not what we expected. So in those situations, you can reassess these with your stakeholders, reassess these questions with your stakeholders when you've got the findings. In relation to outcomes, I normally break it down into short, medium and longer term outcomes. And it's the longer term outcomes that are really hard for a researcher um, to actually collect. But again, this is where your stakeholders come, out, come in and are invaluable. Um, but with the short term ones, this is where I often think about, you know, changes in knowledge, knowledge, attitudes, et cetera, kind of those interim measures before you actually get the changes in practice. So actually, were people implementing these? So as you can see, from an output point of view, it's quite easy to get some kind of impact. But when it comes to the outcomes, it's more complex and you often have to keep going at it, keep going at it until you start to make some progress. So outcomes are difficult. And if I'm being honest, impact is, is slightly more difficult still because it's the so what. So they changed their birthing practices, but has this led to a reduction in child mortality rates? Because that's ultimately why we're doing it, yeah? Now that's difficult to measure. And sometimes there's so many different factors, so many different research projects going on. It's really difficult to measure that. So in those situations, I try to develop quite small pilots. So once I've got the research findings and I've developed some kind of um, ideas, how we can get people to implement the research findings, I normally do it on a small pilot scale. And that helps me understand, actually, am I getting the impact I need to get? Am I changing people's behavior? So just to finish off, these are the final considerations. So the first one, as I said, is I think it's absolutely critical to work with stakeholders, to try and work with them throughout the whole process and don't just engage with them once you've got your research findings. It just doesn't really work. They have to be engaged with from the start. And I get them involved with the bid writing or you know, the planning of the research questions and methodology. The second thing is about budgeting. And I think this is where it's hard when you work with academic funders because they don't necessarily always give the budget that should be allocated um, for this pathway to impact and actually having that positive impact and being able to show it and follow the project through. As a rough estimate, I tend to put in 10% within my budget for this type of work of the overall sum. Um, and I often have to put it in as slightly different things, um, but basically I try to put 10% aside to actually implement something and actually move beyond engagement to try and do you know a, a mini trial within one village it could be something very simple um during covid i had some trials running in tajikistan with just 10 households but i was able to show impact with that small scale the second thing is interlinked with this budget, and it's about being smart, you know, having very clear, realistic targets, you know, don't be over ambitious, don't say this research is going to change policy, because in reality, it's multiple things that change policy. It's not just one research study that normally changes policy, it might contribute, but it won't change policy and policy doesn't change overnight. 
So I think you've got to be realistic about what you can achieve with the resources available. And as you saw with that Ugandan project, I had no resources, only my uh, dedication to the topic area. So that's why I went with the Guardian newspaper. And finally, pull on our understanding of human behavior. First of all, we know that we're not rational human beings. We're driven by our emotions and by cognitive biases, etc. So if you want people to do something, there's got to be an exchange in it for them. So you can't just present research findings and expect them to implement them. There's got to be some benefit for them. So with all the stakeholders you engage with, what's in it for them? And you've got to understand this from the start because they're not going to support you otherwise in the longer term.